Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank Muskegon Community College, its Creative and Performing Arts Department, Overbrook Art Gallery, Professor Aaron Hoffman, and uh, everyone else who was instrumental in making this exhibit and this talk tonight possible. I'd like to thank my family, my wife Haifa, <laughs> uh, for their ceaseless support of my artistic endeavors. Because sometimes these endeavors don't always necessarily make life uh, for a family any easier. Albeit they can make lives of artists' families more interesting and stimulating. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this year's Global Awareness Festival. And I'm grateful for this, for this opportunity to share my art with your uh, campus community. I'm convinced that the free sharing of ideas and the spirit of openness, communication and dialogue are, are critical. If we are to progress towards a better tomorrow uh, for our human race and allow our children's generation to have a just and peaceful world, it is only through a sharing of ideas and a keen sense of openness can we really come to any true understanding of each other and ourselves? The story of my art is a byproduct of my family's personal story. My parents had both left their rural uh, roots in the south of Lebanon in the 1950s and had gone to the capital city of Beirut in Lebanon to become school teachers, both of them. The migration of farmers by the thousands, both Christian and Muslim, from the southern, northern, and eastern mountainous sectors of Lebanon to the big city had been an ongoing process since the very earliest days of the 20th century. This was due to famine and hardship brought initially on by uh, the First World War, then by, Arab by the uh, Arab independence movement from uh, the rule of Ottoman Turkish Empire, uh, by the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict thereafter, and by a need of people to escape from uh, uh, the hardship of uh, uh, the, uh, well, what was happening in some of those rural regions was that society was breaking down due to mar the, the onslaught of modern times and just being able to make it as farming communities was no longer possible for a lot of these people. By the late 60s, when I was born, my parents had become a success story in the capital city by the standards of their fellow poor migrant farming families. They had uh, taught for many years in various city schools, and after many years of teaching, they opened up their own private school, private elementary school, to serve the needs of those poor migrant uh, families who had come to the cities. Because of the, the public schools were not sufficient in any way to serve uh, these poor people in any meaningful way. Soon after, my parents were able to open a second school, a college prep high school. Uh, both schools, although privately owned by my parents and a partner, and charged tuition, they regularly admitted children of more poor families without, who would, were not able to uh, pay any tuition. My parents struggled, raised seven children, and lived the profession that they loved, which was teaching. And they were both, uh, in addition to being administrators, they were both literature teachers. By 1976, my parents had lost both schools, as well as their posh East Beirut apartment, and almost all of what they had worked for, due to the beginnings of the Lebanese Civil War. The Lebanese Civil War had as much to do with internal Lebanese socioeconomic tensions as it did with the various pushes and pulls of the Cold War. After having been first driven out of our Beirut home due to the ethno-religious cleansing of different parts of the city, our, families, our family decided to migrate back to our ancestral village. This would not last for more than a year because Israel by that time had launched the first of many invasions into the south of Lebanon. My father's childhood farmhouse was lost to the war, as were many of his family's fruit trees and their tobacco fields. In 
1978, we migrated to Dearborn, Michigan, where my grandfather had a small fruit and vegetable storefront in the shadows of Henry Ford's Rouge plant. This is a painting I did in 2004 when I was invited uh, to a group exhibit uh, that showed uh, various artists' work on the history of Dearborn, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the, of the incorporation of the city of Dearborn. Dearborn is a bustling industrial town with a variety, uh, with a, I'm sorry, with a varied history of immigrant and migrant populations coming to work in its factories from other countries like Poland and Mexico, as well as from southern states, including the black migration of the early part of the 20th century. Middle Eastern people joined its blend of ethnicities um, in the 19, uh, as early as the 1920s, bringing with them their own special cultures and norms. Our upbringing in Detroit, in the Detroit area, spanned the distance of separation and the passion of longing. The first immigrants from the Middle East were Syrian Lebanese Christians, and they were joined later by waves of immigration from other Arab countries like Palestine, Egypt, Yemen, Iraq, and other places. Our Arab community in the Dearborn, Detroit area has been undergoing for many decades and is still undergoing, in my opinion, Ceaseless, a ceaseless nascency of turbulent waves of immigration from Arab countries that stem directly from the ongoing political strife that continues to grip those societies over there in the Middle East and consequently the community in Dearborn in a merciless state of recurring political, social, historical, and psychological crises. We also grew up to navigate the ultra-complex social and economic systems and counter systems that define the American landscape and its rapid, turbulent history. These three images are part of a series called Steadfast that I painted in the 90s in which I attempted to portray people, I'm sorry, not in the 90s, in the early 2000s in which I attempted to portray people withstanding uh, gusts of wind that represented the violence of war and the violence of injustice. So our experience wrought with the tumultuous defining and redefining of identity and belonging, struggled against uh, struggling against injustice and exclusion while reaching for truth and envisioning an ideal that still writhes in mid-transformation. This is a concept that has been a main feeder into my art. After studying architecture, for a period of time, I studied painting, art history, and education at Wayne State University and received a degree in art education. Upon experiencing certain established divides and fragmentations that exist within the institutionalized art community, the academic community, the anti-war and activist community, and the Arab community in Southeast Michigan, I attempted to forge little inroads into these cultures and subcultures for the purpose of making connections that eliminate the gaps, the generational gaps, the racial gaps, the class gaps, the cultural gaps, and the educational gaps. In 2010, I'm sorry, in 2004, I helped found Other, Arab Artist Collective in Detroit, which was an, a collaborative intellectual and artist venture. We wanted to have a safe and productive space for each other and for other Arab artists who may not have had anyone else to uh, uh, belong to. To have a group that not only brings art to who we are, but also takes who we are out into the art world. In the beginning, it was merely a space uh, that, that was a shared studio space of a loosely organized collective of, of painters, metalsmiths, musicians, filmmakers, graphic artists, and writers but soon after it transformed into a working space, uh, almost like an urban salon, an urban artist salon, where artists uh, who belonged to our studio and others who did not, young people who had no place to go, political activists, and just people in general congregated in that space to exchange political ideas, social discourse, share their activities and experiences, and collaborate on creative and progressive ventures. And there were many uh, creative 
uh, projects, uh, art exhibits, films um, that came out of that studio space. <coughs> in 2005, a year after, we put, we put on a major group exhibit in Dearborn's Pajeski Art Gallery, bringing together around 10 Arab American artists from around the country who exhibited their personal work. In addition to all of their personal works, our collective was asked to create a mural for the exhibit. We were faced with the challenge of designing a piece that would lend itself to the overall continuity of themes expressed through the works of the various artists that were in the exhibit. Conceptually, we determined that since some of the individual works of art in this exhibit dealt with various states of existence within the overall experience of migration, resettlement, and memory, the mural had to explore the migration itself, as well as a state of being that is neither alien nor native. In the mural, the immigrants make the trek from an, uh, from an organic habitat to a mechanical one. They participate in a livelihood of the old and new worlds while contributing to the civilizations of both. They are shaped by the circumstance in which they find themselves, be it old or new, or the migratory state of crossing over. They do not come empty-handed. They do not come the um, uh, they do not come empty-handed though. But they bring with them their talents, values and cultures. At the midpoint of the journey is a female figure, an allegory of the migration, a spiritual guide for travelers. At the far right is a male figure, whoops, far right, is a male figure who is also all allegorical, represented, uh, representing a sense of rootedness that exists in the old world, and which, al uh, which always tugs at the memories of immigrants through the physical and psychological distances that remain. In the new world, Their elaborate involvement in the formation of a modern construct itself becomes the allegory of their hopes, their energy, and their efforts. This was a mural that was painted in situ, meaning in the gallery, from the beginning of the exhibit to the end, which took about two months. There were four artists who, who worked on it, and there were school children brought in on field trips throughout the exhibit uh, time that asked questions and saw it in transformation. So this is the entire mural. In the early 90s, I painted a first in what would later become a series called Land Memory. This first painting was a reaction to the horridness of war and aggression. It prompted me to explore the idea of a lost land forced exile, and an almost abstract connection to a lost, forgotten home, as well as a lost personal identity and the struggle to forge a new identity. The next two are self-portraits from my college days, showing an attempt to explore conflicting aspects of my American self, my Lebanese self, Arab self, Muslim self, artist self, and human self, all these identities. This one is a personal emotional portrait that digs beyond the skin, attempting to manifest the disjointed map of self, portraying a double consciousness that struggles between here and there, searching for purpose in the mainstream culture here and salvaging deteriorating life connections there in exploring our innermost voices, struggling with mysteries of memory and loss is, is inevitable. <clears throat> Attempts at recreating the lost memory of a misplaced homeland and reflections of forsaken homes that are no longer familiar, of a more primordial land, are initially psychological revelations that are intangible and not formed. And so the exploration of these images is an exploration of something that is elusive and pliable. For me, it has become an exploration of the medium of paint through color, shape, and myster mysterious image imagery. This one is called Land Memory Yearning. 
The Land Memory series has been an ongoing series since 2004 through today. This is called Land Memory Distance. Land Memory Nearness. Land Memory Hill Country. Land Memory Fragmentation. Land Memory Anticipation. And Land Memory Memory. In the last few years, I have revis revisited the theme and I'm exploring it through a series of emotionally charged abstracts that are very personal in their impet impetuous uh, and in their execution. No longer is the land docile and the object of remembering. It now heaves with tumultuous activity and rebellion. The land itself is in upheaval just as its people are against injustice inflicted on it, just as injustice has been inflicted by human beings upon their fellow human beings, the land has its own memory and its own voice. I'm sorry, this is called, this is called land memory upheaval, and this is called land memory rebirth. In these last two uh, images, this one and this one, the hidden secrets of the land begin to mysteriously come into their own within the overall abstract dialogue of imagery and paint and light and dark distinctions, moving into an almost spiritual inspiration and imaginings that go beyond the earlier narrative of lost home and ancestral identity. This one is called Land Memory Strength. And most recently, the dialogue between the land and what is beneath the land, which actually started two decades ago, here. So most really, this dialogue between land and what is beneath the land has evoked, has, I'm sorry, has evolved to take on a more graphic arrangement of dualities. I don't know if this has anything to do with the fact that I started to teach graphic design classes in the last few years instead of drawing and painting. But the piece is a composite of 16 unstretched painted canvases that incorporate found objects, mostly ceramic shards, as well as bullet casings and barbed wire fragments. Here, it's almost as if the depiction of various localities of land are detached into separate panels, each with its own pair of dualities, each with its own distinct distinction of light and dark banks, each becoming a shard into which one looks in on, in, into which uh, one looks in on the land to see a separate piece of memory. I named this series Land Memory Karm Al Midan. Karm Al Midan is the name of a piece of farmland in the south of Lebanon that my grandfather planted three quarters of a century ago and his ancestors planted. It, it's actually the name of his farm. They actually had like names for plots of land, I guess. Uh, and where he raised his family. And that's where my father was born. Uh, I found the ceramic shards and other objects in the field a few summers ago. When I took a trip back to Lebanon to explore the country, I was walking around the farm, kicking up dirt, and I hadn't been back since 1978. I was walking around the farm, kicking up the dirt and rocks, when I suddenly saw the glistening color of a glazed object. I bent over to pick it up and found that it was a broken piece of old pottery. I kept walking and looking down into the dirt and found that there were more pieces of pottery in the soil some peeking slightly from the surface, easily discoverable, and other pieces deeper in the soil, which I found after kicking and digging more into the dirt. I spent quite some time looking 
And in the end, I was able to discover hundreds of little pieces of various sizes. Some had a distinctly familiar beige and reddish brown terracotta colored pattern, which is familiar to me because you can still see it today in some of the traditional utilitarian jugs and pots that people still make in the Lebanese Syrian region. But other pieces had more strange and curious patterns and colors. One particular lime green piece remains my favorite because it's sort of strange to the region, as far as I know. After coming back to the States and using the pieces in my artwork, I asked my father why I was able to find so many and, and which time period he thinks they may have come from. He remembered that when he was a little child in the village back in the 1930s and 40s, it was common practice to, to dispose of broken pots and jugs by breaking them further into smaller and smaller pieces and then just throwing them back into the farm, farm land. Because pottery was one of the few items of waste that human society created back then that did not biodegrade back into the earth. Although its, dis although it's uh, reintegration into the soil is not entirely harmful because it retains rainwater, which it later releases back into the soil. This is in strong contrast to the unfathomable amounts of toxic and non-biodegradable waste that we create today and heap back into the earth or air or water without the slightest apprehension or care. So my father and I surmise that the pieces of pottery must be approximately half a century old or maybe more. Uh, because in the 1950s, that would have been the last time that anyone had farmed that piece of land. Before the advent of war that eventually forced the majority of, of the village population to migrate either to the city or out of the country. Along with the pieces of pottery that I found, I also found a few bullet casings and pieces of barbed wire. Remnants of war whose sounds are now silent, but always but which always try to re tries to re-echo in, in the lives of human beings. Uh, again, I thank you and, uh, for having me and for hosting my work, and I guess I can take questions. Yes, ma'am. This one, it's in the gallery. Uh, each one of those squares is a foot square, so it's about four feet by four feet. Can you talk a little bit about teaching and what that does for your artwork? Sure. Um, I've, I've had uh, similar discussions with my brother because he teaches, uh, he teaches English to younger kids, and he's a writer as well. He writes poetry. So we've both kind of like discovered something very interesting, and that, that is that uh, you really become more cognizant and aware of your craft. Like my method of painting and the process of painting when you teach the process of painting to others. I feel that I've become a better painter uh, as a teacher. Uh, that's one thing I could say. Hey, you mentioned the mural mm -hmm. and you had school mm -hmm. students coming in while it was being created, mm -hmm. how old were they? Uh, they varied from elementary through high school. And what were their reactions? Uh, they just, uh, they, you know, a lot of them kind of like, oh, I don't even know where it is. <laughs> a lot of them were very uh, kind of oohed by the, uh, just the cartoonish aspect of some parts of it. They really liked that. Um, and. Uh, you know, Dearborn public school art teachers are trained in something called the visual thinking strategies, or VTS, uh, which is a, a method of allowing students to kind of look at art and describe it themselves without anything coming from the teacher. So this, was re this really lent itself to that because it's very narrative. It's very much like a, it's got characters, it's got setting, it's got story. So they really love to do that. And, and a lot of those students uh, kind of like were used to the process in the classroom. So they, uh, they really like the piece. Mm -hmm. I was nine years old in 1978. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was already here since the late 60s. 
But he had left Lebanon for economic reasons. He couldn't make it as a farmer anymore, so he went to Africa. He, uh, he had a textile store in West Africa. A lot of Lebanese people actually live, left the country to try to make a living there. Uh, a lot of them went to Africa or South America before they came to the United States. Uh, by the mid middle of the 20th century, more people were coming to the United States. So he had left Africa and gone to, came to Dearborn because there, were already, there was already an Arab community there, uh, especially like in the neighborhood around the Rouge plant. He tried to work in the Rouge plant, I was telling someone earlier, but he really couldn't. He it was too difficult for him. My uncle did work in the Rouge plant for a considerable while, for many years. So my grandfather had a small vegetable place there, so he was kind of like, his vegetable store was like the uh, kind of a main part of the community. And so he tried to get us to leave Lebanon throughout the 70s. He tried to get my father to leave throughout the Civil War, and my father wouldn't because, you know, he had just lost his school, but he still didn't want to kind of leave that behind. And eventually he convinced them, and, and we came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Detroit. yeah, the one in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Diogo Rivera has. I don't know if anyone's been to Detroit to the museum in Detroit, but there's a there's a room even large, maybe a little bit larger than this room, and it's got uh, murals painted right on the walls on all four walls called uh, Detroit Industry, and it's a mural that Diogo Rivera was commissioned to paint in the 1930s to depict the auto industry in Detroit. So he came from Mexico to Detroit just to paint that, and he was here for a few months. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I, I would see those murals ever since I was a, as a kid, so yeah. Mm -hmm. How large is this? This is 24 feet across by eight feet. And is it permanently displayed? Uh, well, it's had a bunch of homes. It's, paint, it's on canvas. So we had it in the gallery, we painted it on canvas. And so for a while, the Dearborn schools, um, after it was in the gallery, Dearborn schools administrative offices had it in their building in the hallway for a couple years, and then they wanted to remodel, so we took it somewhere else, and now it's in, a, it's in this place in Detroit that teaches film and video and to, like, to older people. Mm -hmm. So they adopted it. Can you talk about the nature of the collaborative process? You said you had four people. Mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. How did you get together for the idea? I mean, was it was it everybody was assigned a certain section, or how how did you design it and execute it with that many people involved? Uh, the theme came from the theme of the exhibit, the larger exhibit, which had individual artworks by the individual artists. And that, that theme was kind of like very similar to the theme of my personal work. So, and and some, you know, a lot of the Arab American artists who live in, that, in the Detroit area kind of have similar themes that they kind of attack, like themes of identity and stuff like that. So, um, uh, and you know, having, come, having been born into families of immigrants. Um, so the, the mural kind of was a little bit connected to a lot of our personal works. And we kind of sat together, uh, the four artists. Uh, I was the one amongst the four that was more of a painter than the other ones. Actually, the other ones, one of them was a, he, he does uh, electronic music and he does film and video. And he did a little drawing in college, but it's not, it's not really his main thing. Another one is purely a filmmaker. So it's, uh, drawing and painting was totally not his thing. And the other one was a painter like myself. So I acted as the lead artist, and we kind of like had many sessions where we just like sat and sketched or wrote out ideas. We would exchange them, and then we finally came out with a number of sketches that represent that, that basically uh, like eventually became different parts of this mural. Uh, and but then we looked at them and we said, how could these become a narrative? And then we 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 knew that we wanted to have a central theme of migration and like connecting the old world to the new, as well as like uh, old things like uh, a rural life to a city life. So uh, a lot of the, what you see here are basically, um, you know, they come from different sketches and we kind of like created this narrative. What direction is your, your last piece that you did was um, small re relief and it mm -hmm. um, was implemented differently. 
different objects and textures. Mm -hmm. And is that the direction that you're going more? I think so. I, I, um, let's see, I don't know if I'm going backwards or forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think these uh, landscapes are turning more abstract, and they're beginning to uh, represent more than that. Just that, like uh, initial uh, instinct of uh, something more, you know, personal, like to to my family history. Now it's becoming more about, uh, you know, I'm beginning to connect more to a lot of the abstract expressionists of the 1950s. Uh, and like what uh, they, I don't know what each of them was thinking. A lot of a lot of their paintings could be very inter interpreted in very different ways by different people. So it's kind of like I'm kind of just exploring abstract art or abstract painting, and in a way that people can look at it and see different things. Now, so I'm trying to kind of like, you know, when you look at one like this or like this, it could be a landscape, but it really could could also not be a landscape. Mm -hmm. It sort of reminds me of your last one. Large pieces, large works, but he implements, you know, maybe a piece of an airplane mm -hmm. or straw, mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. This makes it personal, but yet to you, but yet familiar objects to us. Right. Yeah, and I especially like those objects because, you know, they're abstract in themselves. They could be anything, really. And they all, their material, too, is very kind of, uh, yeah. Hmm. We're going to open up the gallery uh, after we finish up in here. So if anybody would like to come and see the show again, um, you know, after we, we heard all about it, you're welcome to come down there. So. Thank you.